Good evening, folks out there in Cyberland. Hello there, and welcome to Skylight Social's Episode 3 with Dennis DeYoung. My name is Michael Unger. I'm the Artistic Director at Skylight Music Theater. And uh, the noise we hear outside the window as I'm sheltering in place in New York City with my family is the 7 o'clock, 7 o'clock in New York. Uh, cheers for those on the, working on the front line. So our, our thanks go out to those people. Our hearts go out to those affected by this horrible virus. Um, and uh, that will die down in a couple minutes. So, um, so again, welcome to our third episode of Skylight Social, which is a way for us to stay connected with our wonderful audience, you. Uh, we would, of course, rather see you in person in our beautiful theaters. But to misquote a little musical called Hamilton, we'll be back. First off, I want to tell you about our upcoming gala called Skylight Sings, a virtual concert, which will take place on Thursday, May 21st at 7 p.m. Central Time. That's Thursday, May 21st, 7 p.m. Central. And this is a very special gala concert, which was supposed to be in our beautiful Cabot Theater, but because of what's going on, we're obviously gonna do it virtually. We have tons of guests, tons of Skylight favorites, and some very special guests that we will tell you about at the end of this broadcast. So don't change the channel. So uh, I am very pleased tonight to welcome my rock and roll hero from middle school and high school. And I don't think I'd be alone in saying that. Um, so as my sisters would attest, my high school bedroom, which had similar wallpaper, uh, was filled with records, most of them of the Sticks catalog. And um, I met Dennis DeYoung. We'll tell you about that story, about how we met. Um, and uh, he is, has written a wonderful musical version of Victor Hugo's Hunchback of Notre Dame. And when we did our season announcement last February in the Cabot Theater, Dennis offered to come and be part of the announcement. And he asked if he could, I asked if he would sing a song. He said yes. Um, and what he sang was not from a musical that we're going to do or from any musical. But when this man offers to sing this song at your season announcement, you don't say no. Our season opener, Dennis DeYoung's The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Ladies and gentlemen, sticks is Dennis DeYoung. <laughs> that voice oh my god anyway uh so uh you can submit comments to dennis and myself throughout this broadcast and we're also adding links in the chats where you can fill in your name and email address if you want to stay up to date on dennis's production of hunchback at skylight so without any further ado i'd like to welcome to the screen my friend and yours mr dennis de young hello dennis well, thank how are you, you? Thank i'm uh Truthfully, I'll tell you the truth. This Tell morning, truth. I'm in my bedroom trying to catch some sleep, and suddenly my my sweatpants storm into the room and demand that I get up and wash them. That's how I am. There you go. Very good. Very good. You know, uh, as we speak right now, I didn't shave exactly today because this is this is the day I go out to get groceries, so it's dangerous, and I don't want I don't want to be too clean shaven for that. But uh, as we speak, I didn't shave. I, I didn't uh, shave here, but I did shave my legs for you. So Great. there. Um, I didn't shave either. Yesterday I was clean, clean shaven. Today this happened. I woke up with this. So Dennis, but we met. You're proving, you're proving evolution. There you go. Uh, we met 26 years ago, outside Steppenwolf Theater in Chicago. I was assistant directing a production of A Clockwork Orange at the time, fun little show. Um, and I arrived at tech rehearsal one day, or I guess it was a preview, and I saw Dennis DeYoung outside the building. And I said, are you Dennis DeYoung? And he said, what did you say? I said, uh, why, why at your age are you still riding a bicycle? <laughs> it wasn't a tricycle. Anyway, uh, are you Dennis DeYoung? He said, yes, I am. He said, do you like musicals? I said, of course I do. He said, I've written a musical version of Hunchback of Notre Dame. So that was cool. And 
a couple months after rehearsals finished, I got a, a call from Steppenwolf and they said, this guy, Dennis Young, wants your phone number. Can we give it to him? And I said, of course you can. And I called Dennis, he invited me to his house and I heard him sing this amazing musical, single-handedly, go Dennis. Well, you know, uh, the joke is Michael was on a bicycle, you know, and um, he, he presented himself as, a, as, a, as a, a real sticks fan and you can always smell the ones that are just lying. He was, and so I was trying to find uh, a director for, um, for the musical. And I'd had um, several people, producers come in and watch me do what I used to call my dog and pony show, where I would play the music that I'd recorded and tell them the story, had a book with some, some dialogue in it and scenes and, but it really wasn't completely fleshed out, but you know, Michael loved it immediately. And so I, I needed somebody that I, I thought would be understanding of from, from where I came from. And so he came out and, Tell everybody, you know, tell everybody who you brought to my house. Uh, I brought Gary Sinise because he was obviously one of the kingpins of Steppenwolf Theater. Um, so Gary and I uh, came to Dennis's house and listened to it. That was the second time I heard the show. I brought fabulous set designer Robert Brill and another fabulous set designer, Todd Rosenthal. And so I heard it like three or four times. And I think Gary went back with Todd Rosenthal or something anyway. Um, how many times did you perform that musical by yourself in your living room? For Maybe people? 15. And uh, I did it not only there, but uh, several places. And um, But the funny thing is, is like Brill and Todd, they weren't even really famous then, like they became. And uh, Gary, uh, he really liked it. Now, I mean, obviously, I was in, in awe of Gary Sinise, he was in my house. And the funny thing was, you, you and I talked, you said, you said, Gary is really interested. And I said, phew, that's so unbelievable. Now, now, as the universe spins far beyond our control, next day I get up, I read the newspaper. There's the announcement of the Oscar nominees, n n nominations for that year. And Gary gets a nomination for Forrest Gump. Well, you know, whatever happened after that, it, this whole Steppenwolf thing kind of went that way. And he became a movie star. And so, uh, and, and so I'd seen Gary a couple times since then. Uh, great guy. Uh, but he went on to have, a, I think he went on to have some sort of acting career, didn't he? Uh, yeah, he's done okay. He's done okay. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so anyway, 26 years ago, uh, when I didn't have nearly the directing resume that I have now, I said to Dennis, if I ever run a theater, the show I want to do in my theater is Hunchback of Notre Dame by Dennis DeYoung. And now, 26 years later, here I am running Skylight Music Theater with a wonderful host of a small but mighty staff. And uh, Hunchback is on our schedule for the 2021 season. So we're thrilled about that. Um, well, my, Michael is, um, he, what you may not know about him because um, he's been directing all over the United States for the last 20 years at least. Um, is not only is he, he, he you know, he's a, just a really good person. Not only is he a great director, but uh, listen, I've, I've worked with directors. I won't mention names, although for the right amount of money, I may, uh, who I think, you know, they're, they're certifiably nuts. Um, <clears throat> but um, Michael is just a decent guy and a typical Chicago. And that's why we hit it off. And he does brilliant work. And then he does charity work. He doesn't make a big deal out of it, but he does. And, one time, what? How many years ago was it when we did? Like six, seven years ago? When? Uh, five, uh, six, five, six. Yeah. Five, six years ago, he was working in Newtown. Yes, that Newtown in Connecticut, and trying uh, to uh, help all the kids um, who were, you know, so affected by the, that tragedy. He would go there, and he just didn't, you know, show up and do a photo op and leave. He went there and he worked with the kids, and he really gave them his full attention and brought like famous people from New York to try to interest these children who had been <clears throat> traumatized in into the performing arts. And he did. And he, and he called me up and he said one day, because uh, I had written a, a, um, a score to uh, 101 Dalmatians, uh, um, a piece directed by Jerry Zaks, the very famous Jerry Zaks. And um, I'd written the score to it. So he asked if he could um, rearrange the book a bit and when I help him with that in um, rewriting parts of the score that would <clears throat> not, maybe not be as 
abrasive, you know, to uh, these kids who were trying to recover. And I said, sure, he would. And so we actually did that via phone. And then, of course, I went there and I had the opportunity. This is a great opportunity. You know, you read about to see this stuff on TV. God, it's heartbreaking, shocking, crazy. It doesn't make any sense to you. And so there I am. Uh, I'm like, I'm, uh, it's like CNN. I, I'm there where the CNN cameras are. And uh, we're working on the musical. And um, it was just, uh, an, it's one of the um, treasured experiences of my life. Because there I am, you know, the, um, the teachers, one in particular, the music teacher, whose name is? Mary Rose Christopic. Yeah, who saved all those kids. There I am taking a photo op with her and meeting all these kids. And um, it was, he, he directed it, was a, it was a joy to see. Um, and he, he did such a great job that I wanted people to know the guy that you got in Milwaukee, you're lucky to have one, I'm telling you this. And I know stuff. <laughs> Just check the billboard. Thank so, you, Dennis. Uh, no, it's true. And, and, and Michael is a really talented guy. And he said, let's do this thing as, if, if I ever get a, uh, become an artistic director. And now he is. And we're going to do it, come, come heck or high water. That's right. So I have an admission to make, though. So we did adapt 101 Dalmatians because Cruella de Vil is extremely cruel. And we turned her into a germaphobe uh, yeah. so that it would be a little more palatable in Newtown, obviously. But I cast actually 102 Dalmatians. So in this picture, there are 102 kids because I miscounted by one. Oh, well. Um, yeah, well, you know what? New York Times came in. It was a scathing review. How dare they? Yeah. One more chance. And that's the, can't they yeah. read the mark? So um, here is Mary Rose Christopic, that wonderful music teacher at Sandy oh, Hook yeah. Elementary. Yeah. Who, yeah, I remember yeah. Dennis uh, was very moved by this experience and meeting her. So, an yeah. artistic director, a goof, and a hero. That's what. And that look, is. here's Mary Rose now. Thank you, Mary Rose. How you doing down there in Florida? Uh, yep. Um, oh, she's, look at her. You look at that. You, she's watching. Fantastic. You keep watching. We're gonna do something. So here's a little gift for all y'all. Um, we uh, The production of 101 Dalmatians was done through the 1214 Foundation and its performing arts arm called New Arts. And we had the opportunity to perform at Radio City Music Hall with 70 of our kids for something called We Day. And it was pretty awesome to see all these kids jumping around to Dennis's song, be a little bit braver. Great message. Here we go. Amazing kids. Yeah. Oh, well, oh, it's, that's, it's just so I, beautiful. And and I think to myself, I'm glad when Michael came up to me looking a little a bit disheveled, I must say, and on a bicycle, a man in his 20s, Jesus. And he said, uh, I'm a Sticks fan. I'm glad he didn't say, oh, you're the one and walk away. <laughs> All right. So here's a question. You've, you've worn lots of hats, had lots of different lives. You've been a rock star, still are, an actor when you paid, played Pontius Pilate and Jesus Christ Superstar, and then you wrote a musical. So let's, can you take us on the journey from Dennis the rock star to Dennis the actor to Dennis the writer of musicals? Well, it's crazy because um, while I absolutely brought lots of theatrical elements to the Sticks performances, their concerts, um, I, you know, I never had any ambitions to write a musical as it were or to be a, uh, a musical actor. I probably somewhere deep in, you know, hidden inside, right? Geez, I'd like to be going, I wonder what the king is doing tonight. Probably always wanted to do that role. But beyond that, I didn't have those aspirations. And then my sister-in-law, Dawn, uh, got married in uh, like 1993, got married to a guy 
in California. I never met him. Went to the to the reception, and uh, he was um, the line producer to the 20th anniversary of the Jesus Christ Superstar film with Teddy Neely and Carl Anderson. Irene Cara plays Mary Magdalene. He comes up to me at the conception, I mean the reception, and he says, um, I want you to be Pontius Pilate in this. And I thought, man, this guy's got empty as bong water every six months. Something's wrong with this guy. So anyway, um, I think, ah. So he keeps on me. He comes back from the honeymoon. He's calling me up. And I said, Forbes, not you know, not really. I, I don't think I, sh I can do this. He said, I know you can. I'm a Sticks fan. I know you can do this. So I, he says, come to New York and meet the director. So I go there. And I get on the elevator in this, you know, where all the people there are on whatever. The, I can't remember the name of the, the, the building. And I get, this, is, this really happened to me. I get in the elevator. I was about, as I'm about to get in the elevator, there's Adam Sandler standing there. Well, he's on SNL at the time. It wasn't until later that I figured out he was a huge Sticks fan and didn't have, didn't have the, you know, the nerve to come up and say anything to me. I didn't. I said, oh, there's Opera Man. So I get in the elevator. He doesn't get in. Who do I get in the elevator with? Two people on it. It's Neil Simon. And then I'm going up to meet the director and maybe sing a song for them. I'm thinking, why am I in this building? That's Neil Simon. I don't belong here. Something, there's a mistake. So I went up there and I sang the, uh, I, I sang Pilot's Dream. And, um, you know, I got, uh, they said I had the, the job already, but they just wanted to make sure that I could walk and talk. And then I did it. And because of that, um, I, I did it, it, um, it in, in L.A. We were there for three weeks. And I'm trying to think it was Universal Amphitheater at the time that was they had that that that, that venue. And um, Danny Goldberg, a guy who did, actually managed me earlier in my career, was there in the audience. He was now running uh, Atlantic Records. And he calls me up and said, I saw you do it. You were great. You want to make a Broadway album? So I said, yeah, sure, I'll do that. You know, it was like an unplugged album. But while I was in Superstar, I'm I'm in it every day. You know, I'm it's, you know. I have to crucify Jesus sir, you know, eight times a week. <laughs> Tough work. So I'm thinking, you know, although I'm an actor in this, I'd rather be at, maybe you should try writing one. So I sit down and because uh, Les Mis is the biggest thing in the world, I start looking at classic novels and I, I land on uh, The Hunchback of Notre Dame. This is before Disney started doing it, or at least before I knew it. So I, I, uh, I got the novel, I read the novel and I, and I decided, okay, I wrote three songs and I wrote them on the road in Superstar in the Hilton in Fresno, California. I had this little tiny keyboard and I wrote these three songs just, yes. you know, I, and, and that day, this is true, Mike, there was an earthquake in Fresno and the whole place just, and I think it's, I think it, there was some meaning to that. And so I wrote those three songs and I listened to him. I said, Hey, you're, you don't suck at this. I, I I listen to him because, you know, when you're in a band, you have to fit a mold that you've created for yourself. And so any of the kind of music you, you would write out the window, you don't do that stuff. So I just had free reign to do whatever I want, an entirely new color palette, anything I wanted to write. And I wrote these songs. And said, these are really good songs. So anyway, uh, I started writing this musical while I was in Superstar. And then, like I said, I got the job to make the Atlantic record. And, and then I, I started looking for producers for the musical. So people always ask me and say, Dennis, how can I break in to the, the Broadway business? I said, get yourself a, you know, a, a brother-in-law. That's what I did. So I, I didn't really aspire to any, I, it like fell into my lap, like a dumb, stupid. And, um, nonetheless, uh, when I was done with superstar, um, I said, yeah, I got I got more calls from people in New York to do more because I got good reviews from people and I didn't know what I was doing. I had no idea. So I but I just did it. And um and I didn't I never took another offer to be an actor because you know what? Michael, have you noticed? I don't know, but maybe you haven't. How many days are there in a week? Eight. Do you know? No, I don't think there's seven, isn't there? Oh right. Not on Broadway. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah, not on Broadway. There were eight. And I thought, listen, I'm a rock star. <laughs> my, my idea was not to work this hard. Look, if you're a Broadway actor, dude, you better get committed. This is this is not child's play. 
This is serious business, this eight shows a week. And um, if you're in a musical, you've got you've to gotta stay silent during the day because, you know, as Julie Andrews has, to, has taught us with Victor Victoria, vocal cords are finite. You can't abuse them. So I didn't really want to be an actor. I did it. <clears throat> uh, and so I thought being writing these things is something I would try. I wrote this. And then, you, you know, you came out to my house and you heard it and you loved it. Because you're a fan, you like the stick stuff, and you know there you go. So um, did I answer that question? Good. I think you did. So we had some questions come in before we, uh, you know, before we started tonight, and one of them was, um, what inspired you to put so much theatricality into your rock stuff with sticks? Because that's one of the reasons why I love sticks so much, because it was so theatrical. You know, Mr. Roboto, and you had lots of concept albums, and you know, talk to us a little bit, if you don't mind, about sort of how you arrived at that sense of theatricality in a rock and roll idiom. Well, I think you're, if, you're, if, if you're born a show off, what are you gonna do? You're trapped. There's nothing you can do. I think at a very young age, I didn't mention, you don't even know this story. Uh, I made out with Anthony Newley. That's what Excuse me? I made, I made out with Anthony Newley. That's what started to sound What kind of fool am I? No, uh, I, don't have a, I don't have an answer to that question. I okay. think I like, um, I, I believe when people came in to see a rock concert, they should get something more than their albums really loud. And um, I tried to figure out ways that the entertainment value could be higher. So I, I guess early, this is crazy, because you, did you know Elvis wanted to be Dean Martin? He loved Dean Martin. I love Dean Martin too, because it was, if you see my show, there's a certain affability about what I do on stage, which I want the people to just to see me as the person, uh, obviously, in you know, a more grander sense. Um, but it's the ability to connect with the audience and, and make them be part of what they're seeing that the theatrics really do. And uh, the thing that I found somewhat off putting by Broadway is as, as pilot, uh, you know, you got a stick the whole machine runs only if you don't, you, you just don't go on an improvisational tangent. You've got lines to say, there's timing for lights, the music, there's people, there's a lot of people. And uh, you can't go, hey, a pot just spider there, a funny thing happened to me on the way to Judea. You can't do that kind of stuff. So I, as I, I found the, being a Broadway actor uh, challenging and really exciting, um, every time, I walked out on stage to do Pilot Stream, which is Pilot's first song. I get like, ah! you know, and I don't get that way when I walk out as me, you know, Dennis DeYoung, because I know I had a a, a role to fulfill and to convince people um, that I was this this guy, Pontius Pilot. Whereas when I walk out on stage in a, you know as in my own persona as the guy in Sticks or myself, it's easier because it's just me. So the theatricality to answer that short question with the longest answer in history is um, I just like the show, you know, I, I like it. Me too. Um, in fact, when I um, started posting on Facebook about this interview coming, I got so many uh, comments from people who saw sticks multiple times as younger people and how important those concerts were. Me too, I saw sticks also. In fact, my wife, I think you were at her first concert back in the day. So now let's play a couple of songs from Hunchback, shall we? Um, so this is during the season announcement in February at Skylight. And there was a baby crying who you're gonna hear in the background of these songs. And um, the first song is actually kind of appropriate because the priest finds a baby on the doorstep of the church. Um, so please ignore the, or. Uh, Excuse the baby crying. Um, and this is the opening song of the show, right, Dennis? Yes, it's called Who Loved This Child When the, the Priest Frollo. And in this show, I, I don't make him this ogre-like villain, one-dimensional. He's a young priest when he finds the baby in this show, as it's been rewritten, who truly wants to do good works. And he uh, this, this gaggle of nuns finds the baby in our... Um, it, it, it's abhorrent to them to see this child that has a little, little hump and they think it's a demon and all that kind of stuff. And they want it, um, well, destroyed. And the young priest stops it. But uh, he, he then contemplates the baby's fate. 
uh, which is one of my favorite songs from the show. And 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 what Michael doesn't know, yeah, the the crying. It was more than one baby because I was literally sitting right next to them uh, when this was done. And then after the, they they removed the babies out of total anxiety, that's me crying in the background. <laughs> Uh, here we have Ben Tynai, one of Skylight's favorite friends, singing Who Would Love This Child. Beautiful, beautiful song. Now, thanks to David Bonifilio, another Twilight singer. What? He, that guy can sing. He can sing, yeah. Uh, thanks to David Bonifilio on keyboards, who provided the accompaniment. Um, 
Beautiful. So the next song is a trio from the show. Want to set that up, Dennis? Yep. Well, this show is really in many ways about unrequited love. Every person is loving the wrong person. Person, um, The priest, Frollo, this good priest in the beginning, um, he adopts this deformed baby and then 20 years goes by and he tries to do all the good deeds. He most certainly is a, a pillar of, uh, of virtue uh, to the Catholic Church and to his flock. But he's a man and the natural urges of his you know, of being a man, suddenly one day he sees a gypsy dancing in the square, the Parvi, um, below his window in Notre Dame. And as Victor Hugo says in the book, and in that moment, I knew my life was over. So he was struck by a thunderbolt when he saw Esmeralda and all the repressed sexual feelings that he'd had his whole life. Um, None, none, none of that mattered anymore. He, he was completely thunderstruck by Esmeralda. And um, Esmeralda actually is in love with a soldier named Phoebus because a fortune was told that a man would rescue her and this would be her true love. So she ac actually, she projects that onto the soldier. And in Quasimodo, he falls in love with Esmeralda because um, she rescues him from being tortured on the pillory for a crime he was unjustly accused of. Okay, so that, those are the three people. And in this scene, um, Esmeralda has just, the famous scene where she has just given the, uh, the character Quasimodo water while he's on the pillory, having being whipped, and she, she st tries to stop it. And the priest at this point already is in, in love with Esmeralda, so he thinks. And it's a trio. In the beginning, it's just a duet because Quasimodo freezes after she gives him the water. And he, we hear him singing his thoughts. And then Esmeralda joins in and we hear her singing her thoughts to the, to the soldier who's not standing far away. And at the end, they duet, neither of them aware of each other. And then the priest comes out on the balcony uh, of, the, um, of the cathedral and he sings the third part. And they end act one with this trio, which is the second song <laughs> I wrote for this musical. I don't know how that happened. Here it is. I love It's called With Every Heartbeat. And joining Ben Tainai, who you heard before as, uh, as Father Frollo, we have Raina Roman as Esmeralda and Kevin Sievert as Quasimodo.
Amazing. Fabulous. Fabulous. There's so much more music that great if you come and see the show next year. Um, again, I want to remind you that uh, in the comments section, we're adding links in the chats where you can fill in your name and email address to stay uh, up to date on Dennis's production of Hunchback next season at Skylight. Um, so, Dennis, I have a question for you. Sure. Um, if I may. Um, you're still at it like crazy. How many dates do you do a year? Well, we've well, every. Not the last three or four years, 60 shows, 60 cities a year. Wow. Um, great band <clears throat> that we do the music of sticks. It's called Dennis Dean and the Music of Sticks. And if you went to YouTube right now, it's, there's a concert we did out in L.A. And it's um, it's got almost a million views. It's 950 or four, somewhere in there. And uh, that's the band I put together essentially to um, play that sticks music with great musicians. And um, so right now I just released a. A brand new album. It's called Twenty Six East, and um, there it is. Look at that. Those three trains represent John Panazzo, Chuck Panazzo, and myself. Um, the three guys who, in 1962, Michael uh, formed a band in my parents' basement, Twenty Six East, on the first place, and uh, looking for what were we looking for? Looking to be the Beatles. So um, that's what the album represents. It's my last album, where it began, so shall it end. And um, the first single uh, is a duet that I that I I have done with Julian Lennon, called "To the Good Old Days." And it, it, coincidentally, just yesterday at ten in the morning, it was it, it had its world premiere. You can see it on YouTube. Just go to Dennis DeYoung, and boom, it's almost there immediately. The song's called "To the Good Old Days," and the album actually comes as the kids say, drops. But back in when you were a youngster, you never want to drop your album, did you? I don't think. No, I never trouble. did. No, <clears throat> but um, it comes up May 22nd. And it's if you like that sticks thing, I mean, there it is, uh, except for to the good old days, which is uh, my tribute to the guys who on 2964 on the Ed Sullivan show changed my life forever. And to, to have Julian uh, sing with me was, um, you know, once again, where it begins, so shall it end. And his dad's band was the reason I have this 
big house you see behind me here. That's mm-hmm. all there is to it. Otherwise, in fact, when I met Paul McCartney, did I just drop a name? I'm going to. Yeah, it's uh, fine. I'll pick I'm it up. Paul Chicago. Backstage at Soldier Field. <clears throat> and I got I got to tell him that. I said, you know, I have I have fancy cars and a big house and a nice life because of you. And he laughed. And then he, he, he screened for security to, to have me removed. No, he did. <laughs> Speaking but, of a million uh, views, uh, tell yeah. us about the uh, little YouTube song you made with your iPad that exploded. We're going to watch it in a minute. Tell this, us about it. This, this next part makes me think there's something wrong with the world because I don't understand. My, my, I was, I'm like this. Let's see where. Tonight's the night we'll make. You know the rest. I did that. What? <laughs> yeah, I did that. Uh, because some fans on my Facebook page, as much as I like them, they're so aggravating. No, they're not. I love them. They, Dennis, why don't you join the long list of needy celebrities who can't stand to be out of the public's attention for 10 minutes um, and sing us a song from your heart because we need your music. This is what they said to me now more than ever. And then I, I, I thought, don't we need a vaccine first? Anyway, I did it. I'm, I'm coming, you today, uh, coming to you today with my iPad sitting on top of my piano. And I just leaned in and sang the song and had a friend put it on YouTube. And it it did something called trending. Are you aware of this, Michael? It's something, something the kids do. So um, I just took off. <laughs> and then the comments, uh, they don't even make any sense to me. They are so, I think people are extremely nostalgic and um, vulnerable. And I played that song, which has a line that goes, when people lock their doors and hide inside, rumor has it it's the end of paradise, coincidentally. Um, and um, so they, they really they really went back into their past and hitched their star to that thing and um, said the most humbling, ridiculously kind things about me. And when I keep reading Dennis, blah, 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 Den- I keep thinking, there must be some other Dennis. Uh, because they are now attributing, you know, like Dennis is soon to save the world. I think he helped six old ladies across the street yesterday. He's kind to pet. It's crazy. Um, but I accept it in the best way I can by simply thinking, that's not me. That's what, what, do, you, what do you say we listen to it? Huh? What yeah. do you say we listen to it? Oh. Hey, kids. How you doing? I know. I know. Me too. What's a mother to do? I I don't know. I guess follow the guidelines and uh, try to stay out of harm's way. What else can we do right now? But you've been asking me, would you sing a song and make us feel better? And I don't know if that's possible or not, but I'll do my best. This goes back to uh, 1981, but it feels appropriate. Tonight's the night we'll make history.
Maybe not today or tomorrow, but hopefully soon. Stay safe. Thank you, Dennis. Wonderful. I hope you all sang along with that. So I want to remind everyone out there in Cyberland, our upcoming gala, Skylight Sings, a virtual concert, Thursday, May 21st at 7 p.m. Central. 7 p.m. Central. And the only way to get access to that fabulous concert with lots of Skylight favorites and special guests is to donate $100 or more by going to our website or texting Skylight to 56512. Text the word Skylight to 56512. So like I said, lots of Skylight favorites and lots of special guests, including Dennis DeYoung will be appearing. Ray, Jiv Ray Jivoff, the artistic director preceding me, and uh, just announced Kate Baldwin, fabulous Milwaukee native, done really good. Um, she is appearing and we'll be talking with her. In fact, she is my guest next week in episode four of Skylight Social. So tune in next week at 6 p.m. Central. Where I'll be talking to Kate Baldwin, just like I'm talking to Dennis Young right here. So thank you again, Dennis. Stay safe, everyone. We will see you next week, same time, same stations.